let's start by uh, introducing a generalized finite strain. And this is due to historic conventions within the way polymer elasticity was described. It was mostly done by uh, chemical engineers or chemists and was a little disconnected from the uh, rest of the continuum mechanics uh, field for quite some time. But we can still define uh, an equivalent of our Lagrange green finite strain tensors, but we're going to do it instead of in terms of uh, displacements, like we did in uh, lecture two, we're going to do it with respect to these stretch ratios. So our position in the new frame, the deformed frame, is equal to our position in the uh, reference frame times a this ratio, right? So I don't want preview. Okay. I really wish I could figure out why it was doing that. If we have a cube that looks like this, that has a unit length to start, on our final deformed state, the length is going to be given by these lambda values. So in this case, we stretched in uh, x, shrunk in y, and stayed pretty constant in z. We can write our uh, finite strain tensor with respect to these the squares of these stretch ratios, right? If you remember the f normal definition, right? Uh, strain is equal to one half f transpose f minus one, or equivalently uh, f transpose f minus identity. Sorry. C, right, so these lambda squareds are equivalent to the stretching part of our deformation gradient, um, so the U, right, uh, our U tensor, our right stretch tensor, these is, is basically what's being encoded by these uh, stretch ratios. Okay. So we already said that we basically have a no volume change. So we're going to assume an incompressible con uh, incompressibility. So lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 has to equal 1. All right. So if we say let fi be the force acting on the i, the i face in the deformed state, we can write a stress tensor, which is the force applied to that face by the area, Right. which the area is just going to be uh, right. If, oops, if I go back here, right, the force on the x face, the area is given by lambda two, lambda three. So force over area, and because of the incompressible condition, we can say that the stress is the stretch ratio times the force. So we have this relationship for our three principal uh, directions. And if we consider a infinitesimal change in deformation state, right, we, we add a very small change to our stretch ratios, we can come up with the work done in our system as given by this. Right? Our increment in work is F1 d lambda 1 plus F2 d lambda 2 plus F3 d lambda 3 or stress divided by the stress ratio yes I thought I made a mistake there ah but no that's correct okay so going back to our strain energy function remember I said a hyperelastic material is one where you can derive the stress strain relationship from a strain energy uh, relationship Uh, 
Um, so what we have here, this is a little confusing, right? For a general elastic material, the work done is converted into internal energy. Now in the last lecture, I just said the change in internal energy is zero. Um, really what we mean is a change in Helmholtz free energy. So um, before I was talking about this from a pure thermodynamic point of view, from a mechanics point of view, they also include strain energy into the thermal dynamic, into the internal internal energy. Um, it's a, a change in notation. I was going from a materials point of view now to a mechanics point of view, and I need to, to make a note of that. So I'm sorry if that's confusing. Um, it's just different conventions from the different from the different fields. So really we have a change in uh, Helmholtz free energy. Uh, so really you, we can think about the change in internal energy is therefore this, the strain energy, right? Which we can write as a function of the principal strains. Um, and the labeling of our axis is arbitrary. So again, we want this to have material frame indifference. So it has to be uh, a symmetric function of our stretch ratios, uh, meaning we, there's no rotation, rigid body rotations shouldn't give us any uh, strain. That's another way of saying that. Uh, and for u equals to zero, we want lambda one equals lambda two equals lambda three uh, uh, equals one, right? So at zero strain, we should have a uh, zero strain energy uh, function, or zero strain energy. So the simplest possible case for that is just uh, a constant times lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 minus 3, right? So the, if these all equal 1 for strain is 0, the strain energy equals 0. And then it scales linearly with the total amount of, of stretch. Now let's consider the case of a uniaxial force, right? We'll say lambda equals lambda 1. We can write, because of our volume conserving, lambda 2 and lambda 3 as a function of lambda. And we end up with a form that looks like this. And this is, right, that's our strain energy. So we take the derivative of that to get the force, and we have a relationship that, that looks like this. Now we'll derive, a, a, in the next part, we'll derive a relationship that uh, looks exactly like this from, uh, from st some statistical mechanics, from a molecular theory from a rubber network. But here we're considering a, a very simple continuum mechanics uh, uh, point of view. So if we assume very small strains, right, um, we can end up with a, a force relationship that looks like this, which is class gives us classic linear Hooke's law. So that what this theory is telling us is that we have a nonlinear force displacement relationship at large strains. But uh, for very small relationship, very small stresses, we have a, uh, uh, we revert to linear elastic behavior. And if we look at uh, some experimental data, what this curve labeled Gaussian, this is basically our Neo-Hookian Hookian model. And that works out to a stretch ratio of about uh, two. Right, so as long as we're in the regime where we're approximately doubling the original length, the material, most uh, elastomers behave pretty closely uh, to this Gaussian behavior. But once you get beyond that, they deviate pretty strongly. And we'll look at some nonlinear statistical mechanics theories that capture, uh, that capture this behavior coming up. So we can, uh, sticking with the constitutive theory, if we want to capture some of these nonlinear 
uh, characteristics, we can introduce a more um, uh, complex strain energy term. So for the Neo-Hookian theory, we pick the simplest one we, we can. For uh, Mooney-Rivlin theory, which is a, a very popular model, we're going to make a slightly more diff different form. And the Mooney-Rivlin model, the only major assumptions is that our material is isotropic and that we have incompressibility. And the theory is written in terms of invariance of the strain tensor. We'll call them J1, J2, and J3. Just like we had the invariance of the stress tensor, the, str the, the, tra the trace, the determinant, and the I2 uh, term, we can uh, write, in, we can compute the same invariance for the strain tensor and we'll label them J. So this is basically the trace of the strain written in terms of the stretch ratios. Now from our incompressibility condition, J3 has to be zero. So we know that our uh, strain energy can only be a function of J1 and J2. So let's pick the simplest possible form, which is just C1J1 plus C2J2. So the, the first term, uh, again, is going to correspond to our Gaussian chain statistics. This is a deviation from uh, linearity. So here's our strain energy. Let's take our derivatives to get the stress. And I'm about to go mental. So if we take our derivatives and get the stress with respect to J1 and J2, we get a form that looks like this. This derivative, or the change in strain energy with respect to J1 is pretty constant. This one is going to vary strongly, even at uh, um, moderate strains. But we can, um, and what's commonly done is we want the effects to be balanced, so let's linearize this equation. So we'll replace this form of uh, the, this form here, we'll replace C2 by C2 prime and make a change with the, make it with respect to the natural log of uh, uh, J2. And over the years, people have ascribed a physical meaning to this C2 prime coefficient. And it's really the, uh, um, corresponds to the degree of cross-linking in the material. And it controls, uh, very, very high, heavily controls the response for lightly, lightly cross-linked polymers. So here's a, uh, so one, the one curve here, this is the Hooke's law. This two curve, this is uh, Neo-Hookean behavior. And this third law, this is Mooney-Rivlin. And you can see that the Mooney-Rivlin model captures the behavior, the extension compression behavior for, uh, for this particular polymer. And that's it for continuum theories. We're going to pick this back up with uh, statistical some statistical mechanics. More fun, uh, more fun math for you guys.